Hi, I'm Heather Paduska, founder of the Brand Star Academy, where I teach entrepreneurs how to be powerful, profitable speakers and create their own celebrity personal brands. Welcome to Thrive, the show where I bring you tips, resources, and people to help you create a more abundant life and business. You're in for high value content coming to you from industry leaders who are growing their business, making an impact, and rocking their brands. And let me tell you, today is a very, very special day because I have operatic soprano Lisa Tamagini here with me. Lisa is a New York City-based teaching singer whose students can be heard on Broadway stages and in opera houses throughout the United States and Europe. Ms. Tamagini has also trained singers who later appeared on American Idol and The Voice. After attending the prestigious Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, Lisa went on to have her own very successful stage career that has spanned over 20 years. She's appeared in leading roles in major opera houses and concert halls, including Houston Grand Opera, New York City Opera, Alice Tully Hall, Carnegie Hall, and the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Currently, Ms. Tamagini is in Boston running the Summer Institute of Vocal Arts, which is bringing Broadway-level training to young artists. And I don't have to tell you, I am stoked for this interview. <laughs> Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much, Heather. Thank I'm, you. I, I can't tell you how excited I am. I'm shaking to have oh, another opera singer I on know. the set. That's, that's so wonderful. I know, that's really great. And I love to have you here because not only are you an opera singer, you're an entrepreneur with yes. a new business. So we're going to be talking about singing, performing, mm -hmm. storytelling, and entrepreneurship. Yes. Yeah. But first, let's start where it all began. Okay. How did you become an opera singer? Well, actually, um, when I was younger, I didn't expect to be an opera singer. I, my mom was an opera singer, mm -hmm. and she, after having four of us, she turned to, to uh, teaching and sort of creating um, in her environment a place where, her, you know, her singing self could exist with her mom self mm -hmm. so um, and with four kids I think that was um, always a challenge but she did it and she really um, taught us uh, you know a lot of a lot around artistic and uh, educational ethics so I'm very inspired by my mom of course and she was my first voice teacher really yes and she went mm -hmm. to New England Conservatory mm -hmm. so she um, had wonderful training and really knew what she was doing and she got me started I would say last year of high school I went to her and I said mom I think I might want to be a singer she had just sort of let me grow like the grass really and not um, over train me or anything at that point but um, when I reached out and said I wanted to prepare for conservatory auditions she did get um, more serious about training me so we did that and and I went to Eastman and I just had so many inspiring experiences and you know the rigors of training there and it and it led me to move to New York when I got out of school and all that good stuff that we do mm -hmm. <laughs> you know as, as singers in the pursuit so but there's a big gap between mm -hmm. the conservatory and the stage of Houston Grand Opera. Yes, uh, for me, uh, there wasn't, and that's not usual. Wow. So in the Latin, I stayed at Eastman for undergrad and then and did my grad there. Okay. And um, in the second year of my, gra of, uh, my grad degree, um, I'm trying to remember, I went and sang for the Houston studio. Okay. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was engaged to my Eastman sweetheart, who I've been married to for 27 years now. And they really liked us as a couple. A when pow we did you were that. The, yes. <laughs> what was it? The, the, what is it? The um, Jenna Bradded. <laughs> I don't know how they well, mish the it, names together. Gear, you and Alanya were big at that time. Right. And so I think they were just kind of grooming you the know next how, power couple. Well, yeah, you yeah. know, in branding, I think that's a really important thing. And, and I, we say that we're the MTV generation of opera singers. Mm. So by that time, they were, you know, asking us all to be super skinny and like things that you don't expect to see on the operatic stage mm. and they sort of liked Rich and I like the way we sounded and looked and all that stuff together and mm. the rapport and you can sell that story mm -hmm. that married couple story so um, so we were getting married uh, at the end of that year 
and we auditioned for the studio, which is the Young Artist Program at Houston. Mm -hmm. And because of that audition, if I remember correctly, it, that we were invited to do a tour out of that house that year. It was called Texas Opera Theater. They had mm, a heard, touring company. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that any, exists any longer. This is mm -hmm. way back in the early 90s. So we did that. We left Eastman for the winter to go work for HGO. Wow. And then um, things sort of went on from there, the relationship with, with with HGO at that point. But um, so I was very fortunate to make those, forge those connections very early in the process. Yes. It, it doesn't always happen that way, nor should it. And there were years of difficulty after that mm. in my late 20s where I was redefining what roles I should be singing and so forth. So I sort of, started came out of the gates with a you know i don't even know what adage i'm looking for but you know i came right out of the gates and um and then had to sort of pull back a little bit a little later mm -hmm. so so it's so interesting what you're talking about mm -hmm. because in in my life in what i do i'm a singer yes i'm a mom yes and i'm a strategist mm -hmm. it's all of those things and everything that you're saying, every, like in the first five minutes of our interview, you've talked, you've hit on all of the points that <laughs> that I, as a human being, have. Well, to be lived. a singer and a mom, like take strategist, uh, uh, not even as a separate thing. Yeah. To be a singer and a mom, you're a strategist. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally <laughs> yeah. true. Yeah. To be a singer, you're a strategist. Yeah. So I want to <clears throat> talk about that a little mm -hmm. bit, though, because I love your story mm. because you don't get plucked by HGO just because you're a cute power couple, right? No, you, you have to be singing. You yeah. have to have the talent. Yeah. But you, there are plenty of sopranos, especially, who are really talented yes. who don't get that opportunity. Absolutely. So you sound like you had the perfect cocktail, and it's what I talk about a lot in what I do, is that you have to be superior. Yeah. You have to be superior at what you do yeah. to lead your industry, yes. to become a star in your industry, yeah. to get the recognition and to go to the top level. You have to have the talent. That has to be there. But not everybody who's talented gets the opportunity. Yes. So you had a package. You had a story, around, a narrative around your talent. So it, bo it worked together organically too. Yes. It wasn't that you made up a story. You were engaged to someone that you were in love with. You were yes. both singers. It was a real story. Yes. And it's what I talk about a lot with my clients of leveraging what is there, what is real, and optimizing it for your advantage and having talent. Yes. And if I hadn't been so young at the time, um, I would have actually been more conscious about that and done certain things even better rather than just letting them happen to me. Yeah. So when you're, I, when I you're think, 21, I mean, what do you know about yeah, that kind of stuff? I think it's, but I think that's like a real thing to not just um, uh, sit with what could happen or hope it happens or, mm -hmm. you know, to just kind of know your worth, know what you're leveraging mm -hmm. and, and be very conscious about doing that. I think I've gotten a lot better at that than I was at the time. And who knows what that contributed to it. But had I been, even just the fact that, you know, when you're younger and you are talented, being very conscious about the work that you need to do to sustain and grow in the framework of your talent, I think is a very important thing. It's just all about not taking anything for granted. Wow. So yeah. We were talking about this before of really um, leveraging yeah. your brand and knowing how to show up in the best possible light. And you work with singers all the time. I mean, yes. Broadway singers, opera singers, you know, singer, people who are going on The Voice. Yes. So as an artist and also a lot of people watching this are entrepreneurs, how do you do that? How do you identify those things in your opinion? And how do you, even from, from the outside perspective, like what do you... How do you know if someone's a star, mm. has the potential, how to spin it, how to make that path so they're really leading with that 
edge? It's such a great question. And this may be an unexpected answer, but usually for me, um, feeling, I, I could never really predict if somebody could be a star, but I do have, a, have strong feelings about the makings of somebody who can sustain themselves really well in the business and hang in long enough to make good art that could, would be pay attention, that would draw attention. I, I just got chills because <laughs> it is about making art. Yes. It's not about the lights. It's about the communication. Yes. Yeah. So I usually identify that in my own artistic ethics as somebody who is really humble to the task and really assembles their team to set them up consistently well for technical stability and advancement. Mm -hmm. So singers that come to me with great talent that are looking to just be finished in a way, mm. I, I'm actually not that interested in them. Mm. I'll work with them to see if I can silently sell the idea that you need to always be in it with your technique and understand that your technique is there to liberate your creative ideas. Yes. Um, and f therefore, it's like having a great car. Like you make this amazing purchase and you expect that car to just run for however many years without any maintenance. Mm -hmm. And the people that get the most out of their Mercedes are like consistently paying attention to when they need the oil change or the tires rotated or whatever it is that is needed. That doesn't mean you're being built up from from the bottom every time you find a good technique instructor or a good acting uh, coach or whatever classes, but that you are building upon and maintaining and growing. Maintaining is one thing and growing, but growing can only happen if you're maintaining. So I'm not really attracted to the students that are looking for stardom. Yes. And I'm not really attracted to the idea that you're done with any part of your craft to um, just leave it alone and let it lie dormant while you pursue the career. Does that make sense? I don't know why. Totally. And yeah. I don't know why anybody who's an artist would ever, ever want that. Maybe they're not really artists. Maybe, Maybe that's the difference mm. between an artist and somebody who's looking for attention on their talent. Uh, yeah. I mean, we all want to be recognized for our talent. Yes. But it, I don't know. For me, it's that drive to express. Drive to express and I think drive to contribute. Yes. And that's what I would say to any of your audience members that don't share exactly my career path, yeah. but are entrepreneurial and, um, you know, in a great sense, looking to start something that contributes to their life. But I think the main thing you have to tap into is how are you contributing to society through your talents and with your work? So let's talk, let's, let's go deep with that yes. because I have, the older I've gotten in my life mm -hmm. with my business, with my family, with my art, yeah. the more spiritual I've gotten. Of course. And I just, I feel like it's that connection of when you're singing, performing, if you're an entrepreneur, when you're speaking, sharing your authentic, pure message, mm -hmm. you're giving your, I hope, and my goal is to give your audience a transcendent, a transcendent experience. That you should not leave the theater. You should not leave my presence as an entrepreneur, the same person that you came in. Mm -hmm. That it's that, and especially in a world of cell phones and beeps and boops and bops where there's so much distraction when you are held captive as an audience yes. to an artist who is communing with you, mm. right? And that that's, to me, that's what the reward is on both sides as an artist and Absolutely. An audience. Yeah. And you can be watching a great artist who leaves themselves fully available to the text, mm -hmm. physically, vocally, uh, emotionally, and you can um, in that moment be interpreting from them, and it may not be exactly what they were thinking, mm -hmm. but they've, they've laid bare any possibility for um, you to understand the text through them. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that's the connection um, that, I, I don't know, I think humility is at the core of that. 
in, in art and in character um, creating for an audience yeah. that and and it, it it leaves space for the audience to have that experience I think that's really cool yeah really cool way to look at it and I think it's such an interesting balance because you have to be vulnerable yes you have to be open to whatever you want to call that presence the art the channel yeah the emotion whatever that entity is that moves through you yes and vibrates your body and vibrates your audience but there's the other part of it too there's the pure art there's the technique I, i'm always talking to people who are speaking about so many people who are not professional performers mm -hmm. when they are speaking you can see their performance and i'm always saying you want to get to a point where you know your material so well and you're such a good performer yes. that you don't see the performance. But it doesn't mean that you're just winging it. It's that no. the technique is there so that the performance is, that that technique is not visible. Absolutely. Definitely as a ballet yes. singer, but also as a speaker and an entrepreneur on stage. Like it's, it, people don't want to see the seams. They want to be connected. That's right. The work has to be done out of the eye of the performance. Right. And that's why I think that lessons and coachings and classes are so important because they give the performer that time to iron all of that stuff out in their body. Mm -hmm. And every time a student goes to perform, not a student or a young professional, whatever, every time they, they go to perform, they get that new chance to see what has actually inhabited their body as technique. Mm -hmm. And then you don't judge yourself after that. You just go right back to work. <laughs> That's easier yes. said than done. It is. It is because you definitely feel that you always want to be showing the best that you can do. But, right. you know, right. I, I, if go back and look at any great singer, any great actor, yes, they have their pinnacles for certain reasons in their young careers. But presumably their artistic growth is evident throughout their body of work and yes. that they might be most proud of things that come more toward the middle and end of a career than um, what happened in the beginning. Well, even like even not over the span of a career, but like even over the span of repertoire, like you might sure. have been working on something two years ago and you're like, oh, wow. You know, like, that's not as good as this already Absolutely. is now because I'm a different singer now. Mm -hmm. Well, I had that experience a lot because I sang the same roles over and over again. Yeah. You know, once you start getting hired for something, everybody hires you for that because you're rather trustworthy in that role. And so you get hired a lot to do the same thing over and over again. It seems you're doing the same thing. So over how do you feel years. about that? Because I think that's actually a really um, key part of branding. Mm. I always talk about pick your one thing. What is that one thing that you are going to be known for? It's not the only thing that you're ever going to do, yeah. but 99% of the time people are going to come to you or hire you through one channel. And once you have that credibility, yes. then all the other possibilities open up. But if you don't know what that main thing is yes so what was what was sort of your main thing like was it butterfly well it wasn't until I was a little bit oh, just okay. a tiny bit older but uh, butterfly fell into the category okay. yes but Mimi was like oh. the first yeah thing that everybody was letting me sing yeah um, it, and when I say everybody was letting me sing, the, the houses were hiring me to sing it mm -hmm. so I figured out very quickly I actually figured this out at Eastman the the opera director at Eastman who has now gone on to a, a better place so I can speak about this um, he uh, he would not cast me unless I was in a corset so I figured out at a young age that your package your mm -hmm. whole package your voice your physicality everything played into your higher ability mm -hmm. so for some reason, um, I filled the aesthetic for Mimi. It, it's Italian opera, but you're playing a French bohemian, and somehow, like, my look at that point 
my young career really played into that, I guess. Yeah. You know, they didn't make me wear a wig. I had long, dark, curly oh, hair. Oh, lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> like, if I didn't have to wear a wig, I was like, I'll take that job. Yeah. So, um, and that's not the case with Butterfly. But the, um, I don't know, I figured out branding was key. And I also had, like, some casting people and agents and stuff in my young career that were very blunt about, like, creating that physical um, edge to your product mm -hmm. that, it, you know, being in shape or whatever, we're going to be more advantageous at that point in, you know, at that trend in opera that, you know, those years that was trending because of MTV and, uh, and, and movies and just a real, um, the, the, break of the relevance of the, of the visual. Do you and think it, that's changed at all? No, oh, I no, think that's yeah. even gone further. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and and the voice should always be at, at the forefront of that art form just because of the demands and so forth. But um, anyone who can really sing their butt off and looks really good doing it is going to um, have an advantage in, in that art form as well. Uh, it's not just art form, it's in business as well. And yeah. especially with social media and online, and with, I always talk about photography, photography is so important. The image, you have a yeah. split second, people are scrolling, 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 and if, if you don't look like you can deliver what you say you can deliver, yeah. it's like, I'm just going you have to. Yeah. You've got it. You have to have it all. And and honestly, I'm on on the precipice of sort of rebranding in terms of like the media associated with me because mm -hmm. I'm you know still in opera singer mode, yeah. and I'm realizing now that. Um, you know, artistic director, studio owner, all of that stuff needs um, some rebranding because mm -hmm. opera girl is not exactly the same as that person. And that person, and I, before we move on, yeah. that happens to everybody. We're evolving, we're growing. Yes. You rebrand. It's yes. just part of evolution. Yes. But you have a really exciting venture right now, which is yeah. how we met. My kids are at the Summer Institute of Vocal Arts here in the Boston area, which yeah. is so phenomenal. So you're an entrepreneur, an opera singer, a studio owner. But talk to us a little bit about, um, I'm just going to call it SIVA for short. Sure, short. SIVA is what, you know, everybody is the word on every, the acronym on everyone's lips. So. Well, I just yeah. have to say, I mean, you can say more about it, but I'm so impressed with the program because mm -hmm. you are bringing Broadway, not just Broadway, operatic as well. Mm -hmm. not, a, not everybody has the same. But we're focusing mm -hmm. the, uh, on the Broadway aspect because, and we can talk about this further, as the program builds, I had to start somewhere. Yeah. Focus, you have to sort of balance focusing, but classical technique, in my opinion, is the basis of successful singing in all uh, genres, uh, so. Holla! Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. Just opening up the voice and body, and it, it, it's, I, I just think that that's where one has to start. Yes, so, but the program is phenomenal. It's for ages 11? Well, we have two programs within the whole program. So the, the Young Artist program is ages 16 to 24, and we were trying to bring together um, upper high school students who want to go on to conservatory studies in with students that are already in um, conservatory programs, mm -hmm. all of them having the same hope to go on in the industry. Mm -hmm. And then the younger group, we call them the apprentice company, they're ages 11 to 15. They're middle schoolers and high school, young high schoolers whom we identify as having the potential uh, on the onset to groom for the, the young artist company and to do um, these bigger main stage projects. We do junior versions in the young company mm -hmm. and just to start training them the way we want to like see them be trained in preparation for more rigors and you know some will determine that they're not as interested in theater and some will st stick with us mm -hmm. and grow through the program and show interest in the theater arts as they go on we don't know in that group but it's definitely to teach them the process of collaboration refinement 
um, comfort within their own bodies, using their voice, finding their voice, and you just never know where they're going to take it in that age group. So yeah. the objectives which e with each group are a little bit different because the older group, they are really young professionals. Right. Yeah, right. and many of them are already in the industry. Mm. So um, some of them are singer-songwriters that have already started emerging. Wow. We have a girl by the name of Celia Sparrow who writes and records under the pseudonym Veda Black. Wow. And she is already on um, you know different music platforms and so forth. And um, some students that are from Berkeley and Manhattan Marymount and Shenandoah Conservatory. So they're already kind of out there a little bit. Yeah. Well, what I love about the program mm -hmm. is that the younger kids get to see the older kids, older artists performing. Yes. And you're bringing in Tony Award winning Broadway yeah. performers. Jason Robert Brown, whose music I perform on my recitals, yes. came and, and his wife, Georgia well, Georgia teaches in the program, and yeah. she had, um, you know, a lot of influence in the f um, ideas in the background of forming it, who to get and, and bring in, and um, and um, Jason just happened to be with her on that trip this yeah. year, so it was really nice of him to come in and say hello. To have an opera singer here talk about business, yeah, branding, yeah, art. Um, stamina, technique, discipline, children. Yeah. I think what else? We didn't Crosses talk, into every industry. We didn't talk about food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, my husband's in the restaurant business in New oh, York City, time, if that next counts. Time, next yes. time, we'll exchange recipes. And he, we were opera singers together, and he left that industry. In, and and it's, it's all translatable skill. Right, right. You transfer... Right. It's what you were talking about in your own life early at the beginning. Right, and that's what interview. I love about the Civa program. Maybe they won't go on to be professional performers, but that is such a valuable experience to have, whether you're an artist or a business person or anything, to be Absolutely. able to like, have you know agency over your body and your performing skills. It's yes. So valuable. Absolutely, and just as a punctuation to that, I have many friends with whom I graduated from Eastman who are no longer in the music industry but making incredible contributions to their communities with un unbelievable careers in medicine and sports and the, it was it was all and they were all voice majors and undergrad at Eastman. So keep money in the arts. It's very valuable to the whole society. Yes, I could not do this without Briar Forsyth, our general director, and our corporate sponsor, Willowdale Estate in Topsfield, Massachusetts. As a bit, I can't be entrepreneurial unless I have a real entrepreneur mm. behind me. I'm really an artist. <laughs> She's the entrepreneur. Oh, that's so, wonderful. yeah, she'd be a great person for you to have on. Well, maybe. We'll. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, one more question before we finish. I sure. always ask is, what does it mean to you to thrive? Thriving, for me, that's such a great question, and I should actually like, take five minutes to think about it before I answer, but I know we don't have it. Um, thriving to me first means physical health. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and connecting somehow the pursuit of physical health to your spiritual life. Mm -hmm. I think without um, spiritual and physical health, we don't have any place from, from which to jump off. So I think that's really thriving. And to not place too much um, emphasis on material gain, allow that to be um, the wonderful desserts of, of a life really well led following your inner voice and keeping your physical body uh, ready for whatever that brings you. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. And yeah. you have a beautiful inner voice and a beautiful outer thank voice. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you so thank much you. for being Likewise. here. Likewise. Thank <laughs> you. And thank you for joining us as well. And as always, until next time, here's to hitting all your high notes. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>